you want to learn more about effective management, head over to madsingers.com and sign up for my free management training. Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Taylor Proctor. Welcome, Taylor. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a delight to be here. We are going to talk about some interesting concepts today. One of them I like the most is probably around confidence. But before we jump into all that good stuff, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up where you are right now, Taylor. Absolutely. So I am a confidence and content marketing coach at heart. And that really came from, I've been in a marketing executive for over 14 years. And a lot of my marketing experience in the corporate world, working with clients like Google, Waze, Stanford University, uh, Stanford School of Medicine, Johnson & Johnson, et cetera, was around this idea of content marketing and social media. And on the side of that, I also got my certification as a life coach. So I've been doing corporate marketing, was a market executive for, like I said, 14 years. And on the side of that was running a life coaching business. And what I found was that several of my clients, once we got the rest of their life up to snuff and where they wanted it to be, they often were like, man, if I could just get like the marketing for my business up to snuff and I'd be like, I have an alternate life. <laughs> There's this other part of me that's like does marketing specific to content, which resonates on social media. And so I combined the two of those to create my business now, which is where I really help small business owners and coaches step into their confidence to be who they are. And that also relates over to confidence in their marketing and in their business, which is then where the content marketing piece comes in. Fantastic. That sounds like a fantastic combination and a very niche, niche down. So uh, I like it. I like it. Thank you. Let's start with the confidence piece. I think it's it's interesting how you look at it and, and how you combine it. But, but, but generally, I mean, a lot of small business owners are trying to do great things. Um, and sometimes they're failing, sometimes they're succeeding, but generally what, what, what sort of hints and tips or what sort of practices can, can people do to grow their confidence? Absolutely. So I think one of the first things that, well, one of the first things that I always recommend is to build a list. We oftentimes shortchange are the things that we are the most powerful in and we shortchange or overlook our successes as business owners. Most of us are like that go getter. Cool. Hit that goal onto the next. And we tend to forget like what badasses we actually are. So one of the first things I always recommend for my clients to do is to build a list of their skills, talents, and expertise, and also a list of their wins and successes. This is crucial to help you understand and build confidence in that first level of, wow, actually, I, I can do this. I am good at this, right? And that can be things like, in my case, I often put stuff like, oh, I'm, I'm a good leader. I'm an excellent public speaker, but all the way down to, I'm pretty good with an Excel spreadsheet and I'm pretty good at Google Slides, right? So it can be those hard skills as well as those soft skills, but it's really an understanding of what you're good at. Now, if you're in a place where you're not so sure what you're good at, ask the people around you, ask your friends, ask your family, ask your colleagues, ask those people that you're networking with, what do they see in you and put that on the list. Then additionally, yeah. put any wins and successes that you have. And that can be, I usually like to do a full page and about 15 to 20 in, you'll hit like this. Okay. Well, that was all the big things I've accomplished. What else have I accomplished? Right. And I've even gotten to the point before I'm like, okay, what have I accomplished? You know what? I grew my hair out and that's an accomplishment for a lot of women. And so that's on the list. And it's really this idea of identifying and seeking out those areas where you have won, where you have had success, because you'll see this huge list and be like, yeah, okay, I can do this. I can build my confidence here because I have all these things that I'm building this on. I have the strong foundation of success, of wins, and I have this, I'm going to say this catalog, this library that I can look at and go, yes, I can do this. And that combined with the list of skills and talents is just a great way. Anytime that you're feeling down, anytime you're feeling a lack of confidence in yourself, you look at that list and go, actually, yeah, I'm a pretty cool person. I can do a lot of really cool things. And even if this stuff that I'm doing right now has no relation to my list, I can figure it out because I figured it out for all of these other things in the past. 
Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I think, uh, I mean, part of being an entrepreneur and part of being a, a small business owner, at least, is, is I mean, self-growth, self-development, self-management, mm. right? Absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. And, and constantly be growing. I, I, I love the concept that, you know, many years ago, I heard the fact that, you know, it's not about learning how to make a million dollars. It's who you become to be able to do that, right? A hundred percent agree. And, and I, I think, think yeah. I was going to say Go you're limited. Your business is limited by the amount of growth. So the amount of growth for your business is limited by your ability to grow as a person. And 100%, it's it's exactly what you just said. It's this idea of you grow, you develop, your mindsets and things like that are shifting. Your confidence is growing. And that is what helps your business proceed to grow as well. Yeah. Excellent. So, I mean, confidence is, is obviously key. But if we if we look at sort of self management in general, like any particular concepts or any particular ways you you handle that on a personal level, absolutely. So there's a framework I like to cite back to, and I think this relates to practically anything. But in terms of self management and confidence, it really is this idea of taking action to feel capable. Once you feel capable, you feel qualified. And once you feel qualified, you feel confident. So for me in my own personal management, oftentimes it's something new that we're trying, something new that we're trying to launch or build or a new product or service. And I don't know how to do it, right? We've all been there. So the idea of self-management is you don't get lost in procrastination. You don't get lost in the negative beliefs. The best way to get through that is to take action because once you take action, you now have something you can pivot from, you can adjust from, you can move forward from. So action then makes you feel capable. Capable makes you feel qualified. Qualified makes you feel confident. So for me, I always try to like lean into that. Now I do do several exercises to work through things like limiting beliefs. I do declarations. Uh, I do walking meditations because sitting, sitting there and breathing doesn't work for me, but uh, walking meditations with affirmations, things like that to really help the mental component piece. But really all that comes down to is in some way, shape or form, taking that first action and then taking the action again and again and again. I, I love it. I am also a walker, and here in Asia, I've been known as the white walker quite a few times. But, uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm the same as you. Uh, sitting down and doing meditation doesn't give me a lot. But uh, well, that I basically, uh, there's two places I can think. It's when I walk generally by myself and in the shower. And uh, yeah, you, you yeah. only shower for a certain amount of time. So th definitely a lot of walking is, is, uh, is a good thing. So well, and I yeah. believe like that movement, right? So the, the, I hear so much about the stillness of meditation and in your mind. And I, I agree with that. But I also feel like the movement and the action of your body moving allows your mind to be calm enough to then go, oh, this idea, this idea, this idea, and just really propel you forward. Yeah, definitely. I think the only other place where I think a lot is when I read. So I have this, uh, particularly when I read a very good book, I end up reading like one or two pages and then I start thinking about the concepts or whatever. And suddenly I realized the last five pages I read, I don't know what was happening on it because my brain was somewhere else, right? So that right. Uh, really good books for me is like, I constantly going back to what, what I actually realized I was reading and so on. So I love yeah. that though, because that's an application piece. Exactly. And so often we don't read personal development, like we read personal development or business books and we read them and then we move on to the next thing and we don't apply or we don't consider how they could actually fit into our life. So the ability to have that cross in between in itself is taking action. Definitely. definitely. Excellent. Excellent. So you've been a marketing executive for 14 years. That That's quite an accomplishment. What, what's been the biggest challenges? Oh, biggest challenges in that. I would say the biggest challenges for me have been leadership. Uh, it's not something that, well, I don't want to say it's not natural because I've been in leadership positions my whole life uh, from captain on sports teams to all of those types of things that kind of gets thrown upon me, but it's also the most, it's been the most challenging because it's, I believe in servant leadership. And so that means that if my team is not succeeding in their lives and in their professional careers and capabilities and in the services and offerings we're providing, then I am not 
I am not succeeding. Right. And so it's been a continuation of challenges of just trying to be there for my team members, learning their learning styles, their communication styles, their motivations, all of those things to set them up to be successful in their professional development, their personal development. And I believe that when you have cultures of psychological safety, you automatically get uh, the performance and the high, I'm going to say output, but I think it can depend on the field, right? Marketing is rather creative versus stagnant and continuous output. But that ability to create a space of psychological safety, to create those connections with your team members and offer them as much support as possible is an ongoing thing. And it's never just like, okay, cool. Psychological safety crossed off the list. Like it doesn't happen like that. It's an ongoing thing. It sets the tone for the culture. Culture is not just a set it and forget it. It's an action in, in progress. And so that's the ongoing piece. And that has always been, I think, the most challenging, yet also the most rewarding part of being in a marketing executive position. Yeah, I I, I love that. I think, um, yeah, I, I agree with you totally on culture. And I think fundamentally, again, you have to live it, you have to breathe it, but you also have to reinforce it, right? So yep. one of the key things that I see a lot of time is people people put a bunch of stuff up on a on a, on a piece of paper and they do the opposite, right? So if you if you yes. really want a company culture to work, one, you have to find people who are actually able to live it and breathe it, right? The second thing is you need to make sure that you're that you reinforce the behavior and point it out, right? So if, as example, like in our organization, honesty is a is a key culture, uh, a key culture of our values, and you know whenever. Someone's like, hey, you know, we could just not tell the client that this happened and hope they won't realize. And you're like, well, nope, because honesty is one of our absolute core values. And you have to like you have to keep bringing it to the forefront because yeah. reality is even if, if you have a core value and you show even once that you don't follow it, people remembers. Right. Yep. And even the if they don't even if they don't remember and like write it down, call you out on it in the back of their mind subconsciously is, oh, well, we don't have to be honest every time. Now there's parameters of when and where to be honest, which that defeats the whole purpose of we live, eat and breathe this value in our culture. Exactly, exactly. Cool. So what's uh, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've ever made in hmm. management, I would say? Oh, well, um, I went against my better judgment and I think that's something a lot of us do. <laughs> and in management, it's one of those things where, so I, um, I had a department that, uh, and pardon the pun, I have red hair, but, uh, we were like the redheaded stepchild of our, the company we worked for. It was kind of this like, oh yeah, we're over here. And no one really knew what we did. Uh, although constantly trying to educate the company on what we did, but our client was was Google, Nest, Waze, Stadia, and then we had a couple of other uh, smaller like internet-based clients and things like that. And so we had, I had taken this team from nothing to uh, 30 team members, one service to five service offerings, one language to five offerings and international. So we had a location in Edinburgh, Scotland, and we had a location here where I'm at, which is Salt Lake City, Utah. So grew this team. And in the uh, process of growing this team, I always kind of just followed my gut on this is where I think we need to go next. And I would confirm and confer with like my team leads and stuff, but ultimately it was my decisions. So Fast forward to three years, we've grown into this amazing and incredible space. And I've brought on other colleagues to assist with these areas, right? We've all been there. You can only go so far on your own. You have skill sets. They have skill sets. Let's bring them in and we can continue to push this and grow it even further. So I had colleagues that I was now conferring with on decisions. And I knew in my gut that what we did was creative, creative output work. And there's been several studies that show when you try to incentivize creative work, it diminishes the creative value of what you do. So what we did is we did social media responses on behalf of major brands. So we spoke in the brand tone and voice. We did creative responses on behalf of that brand on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. 
So it was a very creative job that also had to have a high amount of response output. So I had a colleague say, well, we can incentivize that the team do a certain amount of responses per day and we'll offer these incentives. And I was like, I don't think that's going to work. I know in my gut that that's not going to work. That hasn't worked this entire time. Like I hadn't tried it, but I was like, I'm, I know that that's not going to work. I know that that's going to diminish our creative, our ability to create good engaging responses, which we are primarily hired for above the numbers. And I've also, here's all these studies that show that this doesn't work for this type of work. No, let's just try it. Let's just try it. Let's just try it. And in my gut, I was like, okay, I want to be a team player. I've been making all these decisions for on my own for so long. Now I have colleagues who are now inputting and stuff. I'm like, cool, we'll try it. Three months goes by and everything has just tanked. The creativity has tanked. The client is unhappy. Our output is very high, but it's low quality. And so the client's unhappy. We're trying to figure out all these things. And it just became a bit of a cluster. And now I've got culturally, we have prioritized output over quality. We And unbeknownst to me, but I had team members who were doing shortcuts because it's all about the quantity, not the quality anymore. And all these things that I knew in my gut were going to happen. And I said, okay, let's, let's give it a shot. So there was a huge backlash of, okay, this isn't working. How do we get the team back on track? How do we get the culture back on track? How do we get the work back on track, the client happy and still be able to match now the productivity standards we have set, but we've got to find somewhere in the middle. And it was a long and hard road to come back from that. And it was one of those things where in, for the sake of, for the sake of being a good team player, I went against my gut. And as leaders, I think there's that fine balance of finding that. And I could have made that, that decision In a way that wasn't as full bore in that direction, but maybe could have put a couple of things in smaller, lighter tests and really collaborated with that individual. But what it ended up happening is they suggested it. I said, okay, we went all in and I knew it wasn't right from the beginning. So as a leader who had to ultimately make the final decision, I wish that I had trusted my gut because it was one of the biggest mistakes that I had to do a huge overhaul and overcome from. And I mean, I learned a lot and I also learned like, okay, we're not doing that again for this type of work. And, uh, I have a great internal case study anytime something like that comes up again, but it really was, I would say my, my greatest mistake, greatest challenge of staying true to myself, staying true to my leadership style and knowing what was right, but then also the challenge of being able to come back from that as well. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think a lot of the time when you make big mistakes, it's not about the mistakes, it's about how you behave and how you how you bring yourself back on track, right? Because in all yeah. business, like, it doesn't matter what management role or what, what business you're running, right? Like, you will make mistakes in, in another day. That's, that, that's, hundred percent right uh so it's much more about how do you deal with it and particularly not just how do you deal with it but how do you deal with it with the team right how do you yes how do you educate and grow your team saying hey we make mistakes right what's next so. this was a this was a test and the test didn't work let's move forward and reset the standards for sure yeah. Yeah. so content marketing Yes. Lots of lots and lots of small business owners uh, are struggling with this. Uh, both, well, uh, three aspects of it: one, getting started; two, getting it consistent; and three, actually getting value from it or, or realizing the value you're getting from it. Right. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about content marketing. What's what's generally your philosophy, and how do you generally work with customers? Yeah. So I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the getting started. And this is where it comes back to the confidence piece and not just creating content for content's sake, but also I see a lot of business owners get so wrapped up in the idea that it needs to be perfect. They need to know exactly what to say, how to say it for it to be worth their time. And then they're spending two hours creating a social media post that doesn't get any traction 
and they're drained and wondering why, and maybe I did something wrong. And it just creates this cycle. So one of the first things I like to do is talk about energetic marketing versus algorithmic marketing. We are very much in a space where, especially on social media, it's playing to the algorithms. But for businesses that are just starting out, or if you're just starting with content marketing, or you're frustrated because you've been trying to play the algorithm, I like to move into energetic marketing. Energetic marketing is this idea that if you can show up as you with confidence and talk with confidence about your message, your mission, who you help, then the audience will be able to find you, right? The algorithm will naturally support you, but the second you're trying to create content for the algorithm, you're not creating content for your audience. So the energetics of it are, you show up as you, you're authentic as you, you're not holding back, the right audience will find you. So what I like to do is, of course, push for that first, be you, have fun. People are attracted to that. The energy of it will bring the right audience to you. And then second, I like to push really hard this idea of iteration. So think about the iPhone, right? iPhone version one is nothing compared to what are we on 13, 14 now? Nothing compared to that, but they had to release number one and iterate and create additional versions to get us to where we're at now. So one of the best things you can do is adopt an iteration mindset. Meaning I'm going to put this out there. It's what I feel called to do the right, the belief that the right audience is going to find it. And if it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. I didn't waste all this time on it. I'm not bad at marketing. You're not adopting all these ideas. Instead you go, cool. So what could I iterate from this? The concept is still important. It still aligns with my business, still what my audience needs to hear. How do I iterate it? How do I share it in a different way? How do I do these next pieces? And you just live this life of marketing iteration because marketing ultimately is just testing and content is a way to test. And so it's that iteration component that I think is huge and also a gift of permission to put something out there. And if it doesn't I'm going to put air quotes around work, right? Then it's just permission to iterate and go on to the next thing. And the reason I say air quotes around work is because just because it doesn't work right now doesn't mean that it's not supporting your marketing in the long run. Doesn't mean that someone won't find it and it speaks to them at the right time in the right place. They reach out to you and you're like, I created that podcast episode two years ago. And somebody's like, it's exactly what I need to hear. I want to work with you. So it's about that. That then breeds the consistency component because consistency is, hey, this may, to me, it may not feel like it's a home run, but I get to go back up to bat again tomorrow and a base hit is better than nothing. So to use the baseball analogies, right? So to can keep going along that is if I can iterate, I can show up consistently. I have permission to be me. I have permission to test. I have permission to play. And that allows you to show up consistently without the pressure of perfection. Then from there, like how to make it worth your value. You're putting it out there. You're having fun. Energetic marketing is in alignment. The value is there because you are speaking to your audience and you're speaking to what they need because you are tapped into that. You're not honed in on, well, how do I make it? So the algorithm shows me to 20,000 people, but none of them are actually my ideal audience. Let's not play that game. Right. And you're iterating. So you're having fun. You're testing. That's going to provide the value over and over and over again. So that is the baseline components of what I like to talk about is that energetic marketing and that iteration, because that will get you started. That will get you consistent and that will get you the value. Yeah, I love it. And I, I think uh, one of the things I've definitely noticed is it's not just that your marketing isn't necessarily working, but many, many times people don't have to hear your message once. Like a lot of the time it's the eighth time or the 10th yep. time people hear you or hear about you or see you or whatever. Uh, often they're just not ready, right? But then if, if you consistent, you keep showing up in their feed at some point, they're like, well, you know, now I'm ready. Now it's time. And uh, Absolutely. I, I think that's the key about marketing from, from my experience. I'm definitely no expert, uh, to put it politely, but uh, yeah, that's that's definitely been my experience so far. Well, and I so. think sometimes it's the thing, the this is going to sound so convoluted, but sometimes the thing you're marketing for isn't contributing to your marketing, but it's marketing for something else. So it's that idea of like, for example, I do a, oh, I'm going to call it a web series, uh, but it's just 
videos that are less than five minutes called Entrepreneur Sweatbox. And I just talk about life as an entrepreneur. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to do any of that stuff. But anytime that I post those videos for like three days in a row, I will get business. And it's because I'm showing up on their feed. It's because I work with coaches and small business owners. So when I'm saying, here's my series, Entrepreneur Sweatbox, and I'm talking about my real life and what I'm going through, now it's a relation piece. Now it's an understanding piece. It's building that know, like, and trust factor, even though it has nothing to do with my actual services, but it's just showing up and energetically being yourself and speaking to your audience. And sometimes like that's, I could market that as something totally separate, but the marketing for that is not what's actually working in my marketing. It's, it's contributing to and assisting my marketing for the rest of my business. Yep. Totally get it. Totally get it. That makes sense. Taylor. Right. Thank you very much for, for sharing all your, your knowledge and everything today. Uh, any, any sort of resources or anything that you have felt have been extremely helpful for you throughout your career so far that you would recommend for our audience? Oh, books, 100% books. <laughs> Anyone in particular? Um, so, uh, and let me preface that. I often find that when you get like a marketing book, uh, that book is outdated within three years or shorter. So I'm not talking marketing books, but personal development books. Um, I have a book club that we've had for two years and I read probably four books a month and the book club obviously does one. We vote on the book and it has just been incredible and it has been so helpful and has grown my personal career, my ability to manage myself and others, my ability to not live in guilt and shame, but also, but live in confidence and iteration world, all of that from reading personal development books. And I don't have a favorite, but last year in the book club, we read The Big Leap by Gay Hicks or Hendricks. Yeah, Gay Hendricks. And it was quick, easy to read, and so impactful and powerful in the ability to like, what they do is they, he talks about your zone of excellence and your zone of genius and like moving from that zone of excellence where like you're good, comfortable and safe to that zone of genius where you're really meant to thrive and taking that big leap towards that. And that I was just so impactful and incredible for me and my business management styles, all of that. So if I was going to, I like, that's a great resource, but additionally, just read, like embrace the knowledge and the application because that alone is going to put you 10 million steps above anybody else who's not investing that time in themselves. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I, uh, I spent about 12 years reading a book a week and uh, that definitely is life-changing. Uh, I think one of the things initially when I first started out, I would literally walk into a library, pick 20 books with the word management in them and you know, you realize there's a lot of not so good books out there, but yeah. one of the, one of the key things is when you when when you get to know the right people and get the right recommendations and so on. Uh, again, ask your friends, right? Um, mm-hmm. But when you get good recommendations, and so on, like there's nothing that beats a great book, right? And some of the best books have been through so many iterations, and you know, like I love podcasts as well. But the whole thing is it's it's different level with a book, right? Like it's Absolutely. taking so much more work. It has been refined. It's, it's, it goes through a totally different process. And, and the, like there's nothing that can outperform the best books in my opinion. Absolutely. So, I will yeah. rec- make a recommendation for a management book. Uh, so it's called The Fearless Organization. Oh. And it's all about creating a culture and workplace with psychological safety. I would say it's a foundation for any of the traditional books like uh, Crucial Conversations, anything like that. Having the fearless organization as your foundation is excellent. Uh, forewarning the first 50 pages, push that point home really, really hard. But then it gets fantastic. Uh, they have stories of examples and like good and bad examples of organizations across a myriad of industries industries that show psychological safety in action. And then at the end, it actually offers actionable insights that you can apply as a leader or even just as a team member, because we're all leaders in our own way, uh, to create a workplace of psychological safety. So if I was going to pick first one for personal development would be the big leap. And then for management would be the fearless organization. Fantastic. Taylor, if people are eager to get hold of you, what's the best way to do so? 
Yeah. Uh, visiting my website. So uh, I have, uh, as I mentioned, I have a book club. I have a six week program that's called the content cure that goes over in much more detail and much more extensively a few of the things I mentioned here today. And then I have a couple of other programs and stuff that also assist with confidence and content marketing and creation. So you can find access to all of that plus links to my social. If you want to follow on social all at my website, which is Taylor Proctor. That's T-A-Y-L-O-R-P-R-O-C-T-O-R.com. Fantastic, Taylor. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was fantastic having you. Thank you. This was such a, so much fun. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. To the audience, thank you very much for hanging on all the way to the end. We'll be back again next week. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.